before we get started with uh, Dr. Boschkailo's presentation, I wanted to make a bit of an appeal, and it, it's not for money. Um, <laughs> it's for something far more important than that. Uh, first of all, uh, well, I'm Ben Moore, and I'm the director here at Fontpont of the Bosnia Memory Project, and part of what we are trying to do is to foster understanding and conversation about the origins of our very important Bosnian community and the implications of having this important community here in the St. Louis metropolitan area. And insofar as you have all been participants in that today and will be continue to be as the evening unfolds, I thank you. I thank you for your interest. I thank you for being here tonight. And if, if I hope you're interested in attending more events like this, you can look for us on Facebook. Um, Bosnia Memory Project, or you can go to our website, fontbon.edu slash Bosnia, and find a Facebook link, or you can email me, bmore at fontbon.edu, um, and, and I can put you on our email distribution list, but I hope that you stay in touch with us, and that you're once again a participating audience member in, in future events that we have. Um, the heart and soul of this project, even though it's not always what we spend as much time doing as we should, the heart and soul of this project is really the recording of oral histories of people who are from Bosnia. Um, and, and there are several reasons we want to do this. One is that history tells us that often in hindsight, people oversimplify. And um, they often reduce to stereotypes and easy explanations, things which are really very complex. And that's been, of course, a lot of the focus of the conversation that we've had over the past 48 hours or so, the complexity of things. And it's important to record individual stories, not only because they humanize history, but also because every individual is different. Every story is different. And with the oral histories or the interviews that we're doing with the Bosnia Memory Project, we want to cast the net very wide. And we want to record the stories of the people from Bosnia and the other parts of the former Yugoslavia, regardless of age, education level, ethnicity, or experience. I think many people undervalue their experiences. And we're interested in the diversity of experience. And one way that you can help us to do this. Oh, the other thing I should say is we really believe that the best people to tell the story of Bosnia and the Bosnian diaspora are people from Bosnia and people who are part of the Bosnian diaspora. Those are the voices that are important here. And one way you can help us to do this is to spread the word and signal to people that you know the legitimacy of what we are doing. This is really related to education, it's academic, um, we're interested in building a body of materials that will be there for decades. We're interested in the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of our current Bosnian neighbors and indeed other people in this metropolitan area having in the future a place to go in the event that they want to know more about their forebears. Um, so spread the word. One thing that we can do if a person is very hesitant about making a story public for whatever reason is to put a seal on the interview for however many years a person wants so that it will not be disclosed until that period of time has expired. Um, and that can be up to the person uh, who's being interviewed. We never, without the permission of the people, put these on the web. That seems somehow too much exposure. They remain instead here at Font Font. And um, we will work with people to find ways to make that kind of recording of a story uh, comfortable for them insofar as it can be comfortable. Um, and as I said, we're interested in this for the long term. I'm in this for the long term. So that if five years from now, a person feels that they want to sit down and tell the story that they want to tell, then um, we'll be here. The other thing that we're interested in doing is collecting um, documents and photographs and, and artifacts um, that also help to tell the story of Bosnia and the Bosnian diaspora. In the case of documents and photographs, these can often be simply electronically scanned, and we can gather the information 
that provides the context that gives those documents and photographs meaning. And, and then the originals can be returned to the owner. So it doesn't necessarily mean surrendering it to the, to the um, collections that we're trying to build. Uh, it can simply mean um, allowing us to do an electronic scan of, of that document or photograph. If you have any questions at all, please contact me. Um, and I'd love to talk about any of this uh, with you more at any point. I feel that this summer is going to be an important window after we're finished with classes here. To, to do a lot of this work. So we'll move forward with the program then, and I'd like to invite to the podium my friend Vedad Karahojic. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Pompon for hosting this event. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. It always makes me happy when I see that other people are learning about Bosnia and it's not just me going around telling my friends, you know, we have a good soccer team. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Ben Moore for uh, giving me this opportunity to present and to, to introduce this honorable speaker. Um, so I was contacted by Dr. Moore recently in my email and I, I get this email and it's flagged as important. Um, and so I'm thinking, what, what could this be? Um, I see that it's sent by Dr. Moore, so I'm thinking, okay, um, it's probably one of those Fompon events that they hold for Bosnia, and I, I've been to all of them that I can make, and they're great events. So naturally, you know, I believe that it's kind of an advertisement for the next one. So I start reading this email, and, and I'm reading it, and, and then I kind of get a shock in my mind, and, and he says, you know, uh, I want you to, to introduce the speaker. I'm thinking, why am I introducing the speaker? <laughs> did, did he really intend me to introduce it? You know, I mean, like, it, the thought had never crossed my mind, and I, I've been to over 10 of these events. Um, now, admittedly, an opportunity like that should be seized, and, and I am a pre-med, a bio, so I kind of have ties to, to the speaker in that regard. Um, so I kept thinking about it, and, and I had to decide rather quickly because Dr. Moore was saying that he needed to go with a plan B if I couldn't do it. So I, I decided, all right, I'll, I'll speak. Um, but this brought, you know, the second problem, well, what am I going to talk about? Um, so I walked up to Pompon and I, I talked to him and, and he said, you should read this book. Um, you're going you're gonna to be presenting on this man. And so I, I opened this book and, and I'm, I'm absolutely awed by uh, the horrors I, I read in it the experiences I saw in it. I'm also incredibly impressed with, with the actions of that man in the back of the room. Um, so <laughs> Dr. Morgan says, you know, you shouldn't just tell his biography because we, we have that. You should explain how, how, it, it, how it ties into your own experiences. And I'm going, oh, thank you for the ambiguity of that remark, like, <laughs> what am I supposed to write about? <laughs> so. With that in mind, I, I realized I couldn't spark note the book because I had to get kind of an experience for, for you know, kind of get the full effect of the story and not. <laughs> so I, I found that this book is central around three mental phases, which, which I termed uh, remembrance, reflection, and reform. And although they're not explicitly stated, um, all of these are phases that many of survivors of horrors have to pass. Um, some, some get lost along the way of feeling these phases. Uh, others, you know, others make it through. And as a psychiatrist, Dr. Esad Boshkaila knows many more of these mental states. Uh, obviously, if you read the book, he's, he's felt many more. Um, but, you know, the, to me, so many survivors in Bosnia, the world in this room, those, mental, those three phases of, uh, of, of mind mean much more. And even to me, they mean much more. Um, so remembrance, it's hard to remember your past when you grew up in different surroundings. Um, my parents pushed me, Bosanski they'd say, in order to practice my birth language. I've traveled to Bosnia every other summer. I can tell you how to get anywhere in Prijedor almost as well as my grandpa who's a barber and knows almost everyone in the city. Um, but, you know, at, you know as, as a child it seemed so easy to differentiate between good and evil, you know. Uh, Serbian, Serbians had taken everything my family had. 
My parents came to America with less than $350 in their pocket. Their medical diplomas stood next to meaningless. In, in the U.S., their past lives were really forgotten. Um, my family had to work their way from construction to factory work. My father enabled my mother's education, working at multiple hotel jobs and you know, barely getting four hours of sleep a day. But being a kid, I, I didn't really realize that. And I didn't realize that we lived in relative poverty when we came here on Fairview or, or, or the more, multiple trials of everyday life that my parents had to, had to endure. Um, <laughs> admittedly, I was too preoccupied with Power Rangers. You know, <laughs> the white one was my favorite. <laughs> Yet, it's important to remember where you came from, why my parents struggled, what happened to cause this. To this day, if classmates ask me where I'm from, my response is, first and foremost, I was born in Bosnia. I came here as a refugee with my parents, and I've spent the rest of my life here. Reflection. As I grew older, I began to pick up books on the topic of the Bosnian War. Reza Kukanovic's as the Tenth Circle of Hell became kind of the flagship book in my mind. Um, it was the first book I had, I'd read, and I had previously read Night by Eli Wiesel, um, which the similarity struck a chord in my mind. How could mankind once again let these uh, atrocities occur? Dr. Esad asked himself in, this, in his book as well. I learned about the failings of the UN, the failings of the international community to stop even the smallest inhumane treatment. Reform took place in my mind after this gained knowledge. Dr. Esad laments that the guards could not take Sevda away. They cannot take away their thoughts. My parents had always told me the one thing a person cannot take away from you is knowledge. Thus, I, I dove deeper into the sea of books on the war. The more I read, the more convinced I was that genocide occurred, that I would not allow a single person that I met to forget what happened in Bosnia, at least not if I was around. I resolved to focus on my schooling, knowing that the, the numbers of Bosnians entering higher levels of education were few in number. A sense of conviction fell over me. I would learn, and through learning, battle ignorance of Bosnia. The more educated one is, the less, likely one is, the less likely one is to be refuted, and no one was going to refute that Bosnians were attacked for their religion and culture, not around me. Dr. Esad, too, reformed his way of thinking. He had to remember where he came from to tell a story to his co-writer. He has to remember where he's come from in order to progress. Dr. Esad reflected on the actions that were taken against him and Bosnians, yet he didn't let this stunt his reform. He had a more direct impact on his life during the war than I could ever claim. Yet, the fact that he chose to help others to become a writer of wrongs speaks volumes to his courage. It speaks volumes to his resolve. It speaks of his belief to, that even, to even have an ability to right the wrongs, one must use all the resources they have at their disposal. Aid, networks, most notably education. Overwhelmingly, it speaks of his ability to take evil and use it to strengthen the work he does for good. Thank you. I'm going to help set the stage for the presentation from Dr. Boschkailo by reading a short excerpt from his book. Then came July 13th, 1993, and everything changed for the worse. The Croatian Defense Council suffered enormous losses against the Bosnian army on the battlefield. The next morning, the prisoners asked the guards to let them out of the hangars so they could urinate in the canals, but the guards would not open the doors, so they had to relieve themselves in the hangar. Some men got so thirsty they drank their own urine. For three days after the Croatian army's losses, the guards would not let the prisoners leave the hangar. They had no water or food and the temperature was rising. Finally, several of them banged on the hangar walls. That was when the shooting came, as if out of nowhere. Guards on the outside began shooting with machine guns into the hangar. The men got down on their stomachs and covered their heads with plastic bags filled with underwear and t-shirts as if they could stop the bullets. Hamo, who was then on the left of Boschkailo, was hit in the back of the head with two bullets. Seho 
lying on his other side, was struck in the shoulder. The men were bleeding and screaming in pain when suddenly the shooting stopped. A couple of people brought blankets to hide the wounded from the guards. Some of the prisoners had been taken to the camp straight from army units, so they still had their first aid kits with dressings. Oshkailo had a nail clipper. Somebody brought a cigarette lighter so he could sterilize it. One by one, the wounded crawled over to him or the men would carry them, and he picked fragments out of arms and hands with fingers, which was not difficult given that men, the men were emaciated, all skin and a little muscle. For deeper wounds, he would operate at night while a man held a blanket over him and another held a cigarette lighter. He would cut open the skin with a razor blade and take the fragments out with a needle and the nail clipper. Remarkably, given the shape they were in, Hamo and Seho survived. By day, Oshkailo no longer had the strength to move in the heat. <clears throat> he was lying down, urinating and defecating in place. In the beginning, they all relieved themselves in one corner, but later they could no, no longer get there. Nobody was able to move. On day four, the guards brought in 60 liters of water for 600 people. Boshkailo urged the men to drink their small portion slowly to avoid getting sick. One man gulped his and collapsed instantly. Then the shooting began again. Oshkailo continued to take out the fragments in a trance-like state. You know how many people were killed in Dretel? I cannot tell you how many. They broke thousands of bones, destroyed thousands of kidneys, and nobody came out normal. I know it was not Auschwitz, but who said that Auschwitz is the benchmark for terror? Do we need another Auschwitz for the world to intervene? It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Esai Boschkala. Okay, so um, oh, later I, I can I'll show you later some picture I have. Uh, Mostly uh, people from uh, from the camp on the on the couple of days after release. So, so the the book I wrote. I want to talk first about the book because I'm not going to talk much about the experience. I think on that uh, one page from the book tells you about the experience. So um, usually. People ask me why did I write this book, and uh, I tell that uh, initially when I came to U.S., people asked me immediately, "You should write the book," and I said, I, I'm, I'm, "I was not ready. I didn't have enough knowledge about uh, psychology of trauma, and I did say that uh, uh, Victor Frankl, who survived Auschwitz." and who was a psychiatrist practicing in years later in his life, he wrote a book, A Man's Search for Meaning, and the book I read in high school, I think he said everything. I was afraid, am I going to offer something new? But then when I finished my training in psychiatry, I, I felt there is something unique in my experience that I can offer. And that's one, one point of, about why writing the second one that came, it was actually in St. Louis. Uh, it was probably sometimes 1996 or seven, And I don't remember where, but I know it's St. Louis. I was presenting on a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And most likely with, uh, what's the name of the agency, who was settlement agency of international? International. I, I believe that was, I believe, I'm not, not sure, but I know it was a large audience, at least like 300 people. And that time I was counselor in Chicago, not, not psychiatrist yet, and I was talking 
and about trauma, and I was free to talk about my personal trauma, to explain consequences and, and how to understand those patients or people, how to help them. And I did use some example like this in the book and some other example. It was really difficult for people to, to swallow this, some story. And that was a lady in the audience, and she didn't say her name, but I knew quickly what was her name. She said, no, why, uh, she said, you shouldn't, you really shouldn't talk about your experience in this very strong voice you have. Like, you, you're graphic, and you shouldn't. And, and, uh, and she, was, she was from Serbia. She was Serbian from Baskin, Serbia. She later said her name. And I told him, I'm, I'm very sorry uh, if my story disturbed you. So you are trying to uh, take a very um, right from me to tell the story, what happened to me. But, but so I don't, have, I don't have opportunity or freedom to tell my story. It is disturbing for you, but obviously it's not disturbing to you what happened to me. So that event told me I have to do it. And I have, I felt I have obligation uh, for uh, each of us to, to write the story because I'm able to do it. I was always a writer, uh, editor. When I came to US in late 94, in January of 95, I became chief editor, editor-in-chief of Bosnia Monthly Magazine that was running for 10 years in the US and Canada called Zambuk. And I was writing mostly that time, not about what happened before, but mostly I, I would find people who would help refugees how to buy a house, how not to buy a house, how to buy the car, and how to uh, help kids to go to school, how to choose school. That was the newspaper. I have, I'm very proud when I mentioned something. So the book later, um, when I found somebody to write the book, I di divided the book in two pieces. The first piece talks about experience, and it's really important to tell you one more time today that I did not change any name in the book. They are original. So this book is a document. I did change um, three patients' names, like cases in the book, and I have agreement from them. But I changed those names to protect identity. But the names of the guards or partition, everything is how it is. And um, the book is out for two years, and a lot of people from community, Boston, or Croats, or Serbian community, they read the book, they saw the book, they saw me speaking. And in Boston TV several times, and, and here, nobody still uh, make any comment. There are many comments about my book on the internet, but there is no comment about the validity of my story. There is always comment why am I writing this? Nobody still question anything. How can you question when I have for everything I said I had at least fifty or sometimes five thousand witnesses who said the same story. Another point, very important, the, the writer uh, who did uh, work in New Julia Libre, she, she told me that publisher wants her to go back to Bosnia to find people I mentioned and to check the story. It's because it was, uh, some book came out, they talk about the Holocaust and they find out later those people didn't survive of any Auschwitz or uh, Mauthausen or anything else and they claim they did. There's a few few books uh, four years ago or five years ago. And Julia and me, and she went to Bosnia and uh, my wife, and uh, she found she found these people and she asked me how, uh, she always think I'm disorganized, not, not organized well, maybe I'm not, but she asked me, how are we gonna find those people? I said, don't worry about it. She said, don't tell me, don't worry, you always said, don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it, we are going to push them by small town, and uh, one night, and somebody will see me, and a day later, if, all of them will be there. She said, how, they, are, are you going to call them? No, I don't need to call them. This is a town that I used to live. And people here, that side is back, tomorrow we'll see all of them. And then she didn't believe me, she was thinking, I'm teasing here or something. She's a very serious woman, Julie, it's really nice. 
And we came to Bristol, we had coffee in the bar that night. People come, they hear that I'm there already. It was all people, almost everybody from the book was there. And she had her own interpreter. And she told me that she uh, heard several stories, including this one, from uh, five different people, word by word. And she said, that's it. You know, they same word by word, same story with no change. So after that, we have all validity check and we were able to publish the book. So second part of the book, I'm talking uh, how I use this uh, to understand trauma and to help other people. And, and that's the concept that I introduced into psychiatry, like they have to, you know, have to process trauma, what happened. But the, the, the basic description is this, you have something happen to you, you have to be able to process that in, in a psychological way, not necessarily to talk it. You don't have to talk about trauma. Uh, to, to process it and to the, put somewhere somewhere in your body, somewhere where it belongs, and leave it at, integrate into your life. You cannot uh, tell yourself sub unconscious, subconsciously that it happened to me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to think about it. It happened. It is part of you. Like I talked today, it's part of my identity. I am a concentration camp survivor. I am not a victim. It's another important uh, concept of, of this concentration. I'm not a victim. I don't want to be a victim. I'm a survivor, and this is part of my identity. So that book, second part of the book, talk about psychological reflection to it. There is a um, in in U.S. psychiatry. Um, Field. There is a theory that maybe people who survive severe trauma, maybe they uh, shouldn't be involved in helping others or treating people with trauma. There are some people that they have, you know, they have opinion, and I do respect that. And uh, and when they ask me, I tell them I don't know. There is not nobody that I never read research about that, but I can tell you that that. Uh, I had at least some support by uh, the Dr. Robert J. Lifton, who is the first psychiatrist in the United States who visited Hiroshima after bombing and tried to recognize PTSD and trauma and helping people in Japan after bombing. And uh, he, he's still alive, he's still uh, practicing at Harvard. And when I had a presentation at Harvard University, I met him and uh, somebody interviewed he was he was on my presentation, but somebody uh, told me he wants to tell me something. And after the presentation, he he was probably like I don't know like eighty four year old at the time. And he said to me, uh, I, "I hope you are using your experience in helping others." So that was me some at least validation proof that I I uh, have ability to help other people because he's authority. He wrote several books on, on trauma. So that's what he told me. I want to say something about us, not just as a country. Uh, how, how, uh, call me my son and so on. Okay. Yeah, some of my, uh, uh, we're as well as Sir Patrick, I'm a man of the world. Na kraju prezentacije jedna od 15 advice ono da koliko nam treba, mi ćemo govoriti samo na bosanskom jeziku, uglavnom će odgovarati na, na pitanja ovaj kasnije. So I, I was asked by some audience, they, not, the, the, they asked me to speak in Bosnia later, so I'll announce that when, mostly when we have some uh, little session with just Bosnia community to talk in, in, my, in my language, in our language for them, because I want to tell them uh, same things that I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell them that uh, it is uh, it is very important to have this concept that uh, about this book that I don't talk about uh, myself in the book. It's just a story. It's a frame for the book. It's not about me. Anything. I'm not that important. It's a story about everybody who survived trauma of any kind. It is more than Bosnia. It is more than war because there are so many personal trauma that people can relate. So it is not uh, about something special about me because I did avoid in this book to make myself uh, look like uh, 
hero or something. A lot of people write a book about themselves that you look like a hero, like I was the best fighter. So I was not like, I was scared to death. On first bombing, I can tell you, I was in the like little hospital in former factory. I was in charge of the like, emergency room in Duhas, Constanza, in Chapina. Dr. Mohammed was here, he was in, in the red pit also. So when I was the, in that uh, factory as a doctor, you know, the first bomb being, I remember I was first one under the table. And the, uh, the building is very strong. I have to tell you that fear was like extreme because there was no war day earlier. There was no war, there was no bombing. I was never exposed to, to war on a you know, movie like Apocalypse or, or I don't know, Deer Hunter or something. That was my experience with war. But then the real bomb came and then huge wall in, in that uh, building, like, uh, uh, like stones like this size. And they are falling around and they shoot us with tanks and aircraft. I was under the table first of all, they always tease me about it. Later I get some courage. I, I'm not a hero. And I, I was able to put myself in the book as perfectly normal. And I always like to say I'm a very normal guy. And I always say I'm a very nice guy, actually. And I'll tell you how I'm nice. I am able to talk about this, and you have to trust me on this. I don't hate. Because I believe that uh, hate is just a very dangerous feeling, and that's. I think that I was waiting for that feeling to come that I'm able not to hate my neighbors, that I would write a book about it. So I think that would be like introduction. And I would really, you know, I hope some of you will read this book, but I would like to answer your question and have a discussion in English person that will move to, to Boston. I'd like to know your, some of your insights about the way that trauma plays out in a younger generation who might, may not have direct memories like you do. <coughs> they actually, we, we have, a lot of people when we have, uh, we had the, the kind of panel book presentation in, in Chicago a couple months ago, and Refik was a member of the panel, and. Sasha Hammond and Julia and, and uh, Dr. Fabry, who was um, my friend psychologist in Chicago, and people ask question. We have some uh, something to offer. You know, I'm I'm not an expert on this, but I'll tell you that I believe that our kids more know uh, they they know more much more than we believe they know. They do. the The trauma is in, in us and we raise them and they are always exposed to either stories or some knowledge from other second hand knowledge or, or to be, it's always about something what happened to us and they are all affected. And there is a theory in, in, in our, our science that there is a transgenerational generational trauma that goes through even genes. They go, there is several research I know one on Columbia University by a Native American woman, um, she has a Native, Native American name, uh, that she is studying that how trauma of being Native American uh, has something to do with the current uh, uh, emotional state of uh, American Indian people. So our kids are exposed, that's for sure, they are exposed more to trauma than we believe. Even if they are like one year old, one year old or two years old in the war, they know that something changed, something different, and they know the fear on your, on your parent face that you have to leave. I said yesterday, just for knowledge again, in Bosnia, the nation of pretty much like five million people, every second person, every second person was kicked out of their own home. Every second person has to leave the home. So if you think about that, whoever was one year old or, or, or three months old or 10 years old is affected by this trauma. And we have to acknowledge that and then try to help them. So, hi, my name is Courtney Manis, and I'm an immigration attorney, and I work on a project um, with mental health providers in St. Louis, and it's called the Survivors of Torture Project, funded through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. 
And I would say about 70% of our clients are Bosnian. Um, many of them who were in concentration camps and who experienced cruel atrocities. And one thing that we've noticed with the people that we work with is that a lot of times the trauma manifests itself maybe a decade later or 15 years later that you know people who were in concentration camps, they come to St. Louis, they're resettled, they work very hard, and then their lives can just fall apart. And so my question for you is, um, what, do you, what type of therapeutic practices are used to help people kind of rebuild their lives and to work through the trauma so they can become whole again, if that's even possible? And what type of psychiatric practices or therapeutic practices would you recommend? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. There is, uh, you know, in PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, there is a qualification, acute or chronic. There is two types of PTSD, acute or chronic. If acute is if it's less than three months symptoms, and chronic is if it's over uh, three months symptoms. But there is PTSD with late onset. That's the qualification in DSM-4. So there are patients who experience trauma, trauma, symptoms of trauma later in life. Why do they have experience later in life? For many reasons. The most significant one is new uh, uh, life stressors. And what new life stressors? Most likely, most likely one who is very similar to the original uh, trauma. The original trauma is you've been forced to leave your home, your profession, your language, your community, your cafe bar, your coffee with your friends, your books, your stories, your music, your sport, and everything you built for, for years, and then you lost everything, then you come here and, and with help of this agency or United States as a country, you are trying, you are trying to rebuild your life. Because uh, as Viktor Frankl explained, the, uh, it's extremely important to find the meaning in life. And what is the meaning? One of the very important concepts of meaning is a creation. You have to create something. So what do I create? I create my job again. I create community again. I, I create this book, and I have a meaning in life. And then something happened that was very similar, losing the job. So losing economic security is much more stressful for somebody who already was kicked out of, of former practice and professional life and then you have another experience very similar to it, and that's what, what happened to those uh, people. So they experienced full-blown uh, PTSD symptoms. And how to help them? It is if you are trying to help them with just one approach, one therapeutic approach, you're gonna fail. Because there were so many other factors involved in the uh, causing this condition, so this condition has to be approached with, from many different views. Sometimes even medication, but psychotherapy, and what I usually said before, is uh, when uh, I had a patient from, uh, when I was in Chicago Council, a patient from Bosnia, who was a university professor. He was professor of <coughs> math of university, and he has to uh, have a job like washing dishes in, in Chicago in 1994. And, and um, for him to, to uh, heal him with symptoms, the best was when we are able to tell him that maybe he can teach high school math somewhere in the Fort Bosnian kids. So that was the best help for that person. Or somebody lost an apartment when I was in Chicago and when I was able was always to get community together through this magazine. And I said, the patient will come to our clinic, the same clinic, refugee mental health clinic through TIA a settlement agency. And the psychiatrist asked me, you know, I have to see this guy, he's very symptomatic, he has PTSD. I said, I don't think so, you can't help him, but let me find uh, 500 bucks for him to pay a rent, he'll be good. And that is how can you, imagine this, what is medication to help a patient from, uh, any, any patient, it doesn't have to be from Bosnia, but we are talking about Bosnia, who, from Serbian is who lost two sons. And, and somebody is asking me, Dr. Vishkaila, what medication is the best for this approach? She lost two sons. Medication, and there's no medication to re replace your two sons. We have to be there 
for that person. We have to have a relationship with that person and help them talking, and help them finding a good apartment, help them find good maybe job or, or help them with school with other uh, younger son who is still alive. So there is a social worker component, social work, sorry, social work component in helping those people. So one of the ways to help the clients could be just social work. Just help them find a job, pay an apartment, get the life together back. Uh, first of all, I have to say this publicly, I'm very proud to call you my friend, so that's one thing. But uh, what you said is uh, about not wanting to be a victim, but to, to embrace this identity, since we are talking about identities here, of a survivor. Uh, the field that I work in, transitional justice, is basically focusing on how to reinstate victims of mass atrocities into citizens again, so, so that people are given back their rights as citizens and uh, in addressing the injustice and trauma that they suffered, basically be elevated back into a position of equal citizen. But uh, what, what you are dealing with is sort of personalized uh, recovery of, of those who suffer. My question after this long introduction is, in Bosnia, unfortunately, uh, the political establishment, especially uh, among the Bosnian Muslims, uh, has insisted on elevating this uh, population into sort of a, a through this cult of, of a victim uh, to a position of, of sort of, on one hand, national treasure and, and sort of uh, source of the national narrative of victimhood, at the same time trapping them as victims forever. How, how do you see this problem? How do, you, uh, how do you at all see the possibility of these people being reinstated into equal citizens like my, my friend Musreta Sivac, who you maybe know? She said, I don't want to be a victim. I was in Omarska, but I want to be a judge. That's one of what I want to be. So, from your perspective, both professional and personal, how do you think we can we can deal with this problem? Uh, I, I did talk in, in Boston a couple of times. I'm going next Friday, and I'm going to talk about the uh, big conference that we are organizing. Our academy organized by uh, American Academy of Science and Art, organizing conference, and part of this psychiatric conference. I'm going to talk about it. Because I want to tell people at least who is there, and I'm, I'm going to have an interview on TV and, and, and will say it publicly again, they have to move away from that because this is a political concept. Any, in any life situation when pol politics is involved, we are screwed. And anyway, so, and I don't want to be screwed. So, so we have to stay away from politics. We have to talk away, and I'm here. My, my philosophy is humanism. And that's what I'm talking about. That's my perspective. We are human beings. And if I'm a human being, I don't want to be a victim all my life. I want to be a winner. And I am a winner of this situation. That's how I might see myself. And again, it's positive psychology. If I, if I tell myself 10 times, you know, I'm a winner, I'm a winner. Believe me, I believe in that. So it's very important for them to hear me talking about in Bosnia for uh, political purposes. They are talking about victimhood, whole science. And Nusrata Siv, as you mentioned, um, she is uh, my friend, and I did a um, presentation here in 1995 or six uh, when uh, with Yadran Katsigar and Nusrat Basir, both lawyers, one is Croatian, one is Bosnian, both raped several times in the camp, I think, Omarska, right? And then uh, she recently had a very good interview in news how uh, someday she asked God to take her because it was um, very difficult for her. But now she said, when she met some of those people, how did she say when she is walking in the city of Prado, and they, those people are still walking on the street, they, they cannot look at her in her eyes, and she can't look at them, because she can also <coughs> move on from that, that. By the way, this is something I just want to tell about her. She's an amazing woman. They make movie uh, by Mandy Jefferson, a documentary. It's a movie uh, calling the ghost. 
it's a really good movie. And I'll tell you just a story, just uh, how we have to be careful. I didn't want to tell you any story about my camp experience because I want to protect you. And there was a conference in San Francisco, International Psychodrama Society meeting, and then uh, Nusrata is there, and Yadran Katsik and Mandy Jacobson, they want to show a movie to a large uh, crowd of psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers. And there was a psychiatrist working uh, on that project, and he wants me to be in panel of me and Nusrata and Yadran to talk to the audience, and they want to show the movie. I said, okay, that's good, you know, we'll be there, introduce us, we'll be there, and then we'll show a movie. He said, no, 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 I want to make it dramatically. I said, what do you mean? He said, they're going to show the movie. And then three of us will show on the stage after that. And I told him, please don't do it, because you're going to traumatize the audience. And he disagreed with me, but I, I, I couldn't win. So me and Nusa Tayyadanka had it bottle of wine, otherwise we couldn't talk at the time, it was 96, so I really couldn't talk easily about camp, I still sometimes have a difficult time, but at that time it was difficult without wine, you know, so we get bottle of wine three hours, had good dinner and they showed the movie and then I knew it would happen, I just knew it because I already had experience, we had, the movie is very difficult, very heavy, and then three, they turn the light on, three of us are sitting at the stage like this, 300 people, and first Sure, because it was women, the audience was women mostly, a professional. And I'm sitting just like this, believe me, just like this same like building. And I see like first five rows, so that's what I see. Like everybody's crying, sobbing, like psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and social workers. They're traumatized. So there is a concept of secondary trauma. If you hear stories and story, you can be traumatized. And I knew that would happen. And ask, if you see here, ask here about that experience. Maybe he got a little drunk and we, we are okay, you know. But <laughs> other people who were sober and then was crying. So, uh, so the guy didn't listen to me because he, he was a psychiatrist. But, and I, I, have, I learned late, later uh, who, is, who is the expert, not me, I mean, who is the expert in trauma? Expert is the people who survive trauma. Not, not professional, they are experts on the trauma. We need to listen to that. You know, but this guy didn't listen. Yeah. I have a question. I often hear, hear a statement that actually the rate of uh, post-traumatic I have very <laughs> powerful voice. That the rate of post-traumatic uh, disorder among Bosnian people is actually not as high as you would expect, considering that there is almost not one person that's not affected by war and atrocities and everything that happened during the time. And I was always wondering, is it the truth? Are we really a kind of like a, having a better mental health than other people? And if yes, wha what would be the, case, uh, the, the reason for it? There's a very, uh, uh, I said, yes, I, uh, after life threatening trauma, 20% uh, people will develop symptoms of it. Yes, the only, only 20. So that's a good number, you know, and there is a reason for someone not to or to have to develop it. If you are traumatized as a kid a few times and um, um, parents get in fights so many times, you get expelled from school and trouble, you know, you may have a bigger, bigger chance after life certain trauma to develop PTSD. Or if you have, they said, cumulative trauma, if you have. I didn't study specifically, it's very difficult to study epidemiological study. Um, in, in the Bastion community who has PTSD, who doesn't. I did some study, but it's pretty much similar. What is, could be a protective factor is, uh, is we have in our culture very nice, uh, good structure of community. So you have a, a faster time to process. If you are alone, isolation is one of the most dangerous um, uh, concept in, in human life. If you isolate, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, the, the highest risk for suicide in any illness in psychiatry is isolation. We isolate that suicide. So in our culture, we have that coffee. We talk about it as a, as a, as a, as a you know, way of life. It's coffee, and we talk about it. And that was helpful. And then here, I think we have less PTSD than the people in Bosnia because we get the opportunity to find the meaning in life. 
to have our profession, your profession, we are doing, like I'm doing the same things like I was doing <coughs> 20 years ago. Physician, practicing physician, and that's what I was doing before. So I came back to my life. And in Bosnia, it's very difficult to get in. in. My cousin in Chicago has a different theory. She said that she's an engineer. You know how engineers are, they are very practical, you know, right? Okay. <laughs> so my cousin Jara in Chicago, I, she told me, you know, you are second but let me tell you how it is. So I said, let me tell you. <laughs> in she said, in Bosnia, you know, in, if somebody in Bosnia community in Chicago is crazy, we say crazy, you know, pro lupo, if someone is pro lupo, then uh, it's really easily to recognize because most of our are normal. But in Boston, you cannot recognize because everybody is pro lupo. Everybody is pro -lupo. <laughs> so in Boston, everybody is different. Everybody is. Yeah. And they are, they are, I have to tell you, like, the last, I was there in September. And uh, and then comparing to five years ago, they are worse emotionally because the economy and everything else. So again, to help someone with PTSD, it's not about medication only, it is sometimes. It's not about psychotherapy only, it is sometimes. It's about whole thing. I have in the book a guy from Iraq who suffered trauma, like he's, you know, I cannot say, he had very difficult trauma. He is Iraqi Christian who was in fighting for uh, Saddam Hussein, so. and he he was very traumatized in, in the in my book, and he always asked me. Uh, he he has so strong belief in the United States that's that's unmeasurable. Like uh, he he called me American doctor. He he said American doctor, you have a pill for me. Please give me the pill. <laughs> I said I, I don't have first like I said I'm not like American and Boston American, but I don't have that pill. And he said you have to have a pill. Please, a computer, read on computer. <laughs> like I, don't, I, could, I said, okay, I read that computer. Give me the magic pill. And I was trying to explain there is no magic pill, but his knowledge is not like. And and I then I, I just came with the idea. That it was nobody told me, but I, I didn't know what to do with him. I said, okay, give me a piece of paper, and I put a little circle on the middle of the paper. I said, that's you, okay? It's it's him. And he said, okay, it's me. I said before the war, before your time. I told me who. But who was around you? He said, mother, okay, and then father, wife, no family, friends. He was a mechanic. Mechanic, job, money, Baghdad. As a city, Baghdad is one of the, was, was the nicest city in the world, probably. And uh, language, you know, culture, food, music, dance, everything. And I put all those things, I, I can't remember now. And I put them around the circles. And I said, okay. Now, wife, no, I cross. Job, no. Language, no, he doesn't speak. I saw him with an interpreter. Uh, father, no. Culture, no. Food, no. Job, no. Uh, role in your life, no. And he said, yeah, that's right. I said, so are you still asking me for a pill to replace those things? He said, no. So in the working with traumatized patients, you have to consider all of those things. They lost them, try to help them. Either replace them or help them understand how they lost it and what to do next for it. He was a little bit better, I not really much. Yeah, I'm Jeff Bosch. Um, yes, Nadia. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you how you dealt with reconciliation with every time you go back to Bosnia. So in the sense that reconciliation with the place that, so your home in Pochte is only three miles away from Tretnik. So How many miles? It's like maybe five miles. 500 <coughs> yards. 500 yards. Yes, across the river, yeah. just the river, yeah. And, yeah. and you still go back to your home, you know, yeah. when, when you visit your home. And so it's not just a matter of dealing with the people that were there that, are, that were your, your neighbors and still are your neighbors, but it's also a matter of dealing with the place that I think. Yep. And um, I think for, for us at this point after the war, where in a lot of places there still are memorials, I, I, I would imagine that most concentration camps in Bosnia have, have um, minimal uh, uh, markings to commemorate that. Right. And that has no marking. And, and then specifically how that's different for you because you're an immigrant, because when we go back to, 
to Bosnia. We see Bosnia in a snapshot, and the prior memory of Bosnia was, or the prior couple memories were, when we had to leave. Right. Yeah, that, that has no mark, and I know I uh, have like desire to, to visit that, that again. But I did this year, I'll tell you the story now. But the uh, reconciliation, I talked a little bit about it yesterday. It's a time. It's time. Time heals a lot, you know. Time heals pain. Um, reconciliation or rebuilding life together again is a long process. And um, seeing people who are gods, my people that I used to go to, uh, together in elementary school or high school is very difficult. It was the first time and less and less every year. I have to admit, this is a process like anything else. I get, you know, when you lose your mom or your dad, it's, it's very painful. And siblings or any other family member in normal circumstances, very painful. It takes time to go through this mourning and grief. It's painful in so, And then a story. So I came first time in Portugal after war, like 2001. And uh, there are, uh, on the river, my river, we are, you know, I was with family, friends and everything. And on the way back to my home, and across the Drete, uh, I saw seven or eight of them. And on uh, my age, went to school together. And that's uh, tough. And, the wives of them are all there with them. No, ch no children for some reason, I don't see the kids. So, And I was with my son, that my son at that time was 10 year old. 2009, 10, 12. So I saw them and I passed. I was thinking, you know what, I'm not going, what's, what's the purpose of talking to them? But then I came back. I couldn't resist because I was thinking, um, I have to deal with that sometimes, and it's better to deal with that right now. And I was a little, you know, a little scared physically. Like, you know, if they attacked me, there are eight of them or nine, so I don't know exactly. I can remember. And I decided, you know, and my son is there also, it's really scary, risky, but I did, I took risk, you know. And I came back and said, hi, and they all came. They all came to me. And uh, so, I don't know why, but you have to believe me. This suddenly, all of them they put a line in front of me. They stay in the line, like in front of me, like like I'm an army officer, and they put a line. They're next to each other, like, like this. And and I already felt on them. They are like a little scared. What I'm going to say. And they said to me, hey, what's going on? Well, I didn't see you a long time. Like that playing, like playing, playing that classic game. Hey, what happened? Like, what's going on? Really? What guy said you know, I didn't see you for a long time? Like, like he kind of doesn't know what happened to me. Seriously? He took me in camp. He was with me in school. And then I, I said, you know, I'm here. I, I came back. I have some unfinished job. So tonight I made a plan. That's how I started. Didn't say hi or anything. I have some bombs and some guns, so I'm coming tonight to visit each of you. And I know your each house, I know your grandparents. I'm going to put some, you know, I have a lot of bombs. So that's what I'm going to do, that's why I came back, that's why. And they got shaking, and I told them, I'm going to do it, just okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just teasing you. I said, why are you so scared of me? I said, I'm, I'm a nice guy, that's how I said it. I'm always nice. I'm a nice guy, I'm not going to do it. Because I'm not like you, I'm different, I'm better. That's what you did to me. Because my name is different, like I should look different. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But you are, you know, you are criminals. That's who you are. And let me tell you something, I feel good. You made me, they, they have very low salary. If I tell them my salary, it's really a huge difference. It doesn't mean I have money here. I, have, I make a lot of money, just everybody takes everything from me. But when you mentioned some numbers, you know, it's huge difference, um, you know, because doctors in Boston, they make like, I don't know, $1,000 a month, you know, and I told them, you know, and, and I said, thank you, 
Thank you for kicking me out. It was very nice. I'm a professor in the United States. I was a simple doctor here, you know, I couldn't do anything. Thank you very much for doing this for me. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they almost are like, I cannot describe that experience. They just like one by one, just left. <laughs> like, like animals, you know. Like, and it, like I ordered them, okay, just go back. So that was good experience and I dealt with that, you know. I, and I told them, now it's time for you to deal with it, to have bad dreams and nightmares and you will have them for all your life, that's what I told them. About Dretel, visitation, never think that I need to go to Dretel, never think about it. This year, on the, my last day, I was there with um, my friend, uh, couple in Chicago, their, um, Mary, Fabri and David, all were doctors from Chicago, they visited Bosnia and Italy with us this summer. And I had to buy something with my uh, knees and I had my car over there. So I said, Let, let's go to Tretel. It was just a sudden, quick decision. And I went there, there is no sign. There is, uh, I left my car running and I have my iPhone, I can show you a picture here. I said to him, take a picture. There is a sign, do not park here and do not try to enter something like very important, like, you know, I don't know how they said, you know, struggle with that. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I said that then I hear shouting there, why you are there, like, leave it right now, and, and then I'll, I'll shoot, threatening me. And then my car was running, and I, I told him, no worry, just like, and when I sit in my car, I took a picture, three picture. When I sit in the car, I was, and I saw the guy, he's chopping wood with a, with a big axe. You know, he stood up and like doing this to me. And I, I have to tell you, you asked me, and I'll tell you what I did. So he's, when he saw me driving very slowly from the camp, he kind of sat down with the axe on the, and next to the road. And I opened the window and told him very something not very nice and show him my finger. <laughs> this, this one. I did. And I, and I said in Boston, you just take it. And, and I left with my good car, like, boom. <laughs> I felt good again. So I think that's part of, I felt that I did what I well, comfortable to do it. I'm sorry for doing it, but I did it to him, and I, I said it. That's what I did. And I think sometimes it's important to. Uh, yes. Uh, in your experiences, uh, what would differentiate, if anything, does uh, the post-traumatic stress of a person who had been brutalized by others from that of a person who had brutalized others and was. Uh, feeling terribly guilty about it afterwards. Uh, in PTSD, uh, in PTSD, uh, uh, PTSD has definition. <coughs> and PTSD is a concept of post-traumatic stress disorder that in uh, US psychiatry changed the name uh, every single time the new new book, DSM-4, DSM uh, book came out. Everything, it was like homesickness, it was shell shock, then uh, acute adjustment disorder, acute stress disorder, chronic abuse, now it's PTSD, and they changed those criteria. They said you have to have life-threatening trauma, but I disagree with that. Any trauma can cause PTSD, in my opinion. Any strong trauma, like childbirth, it can, can cause PTSD symptoms, and we don't, a lot of people don't accept that it can cause PTSD symptoms, not normal childbirth, but it's very scary, it's life-threatening when a woman has a, has a baby and it's get complicated that women can suffer from real PTSD. How other people, how they feel, they probably, I, I didn't talk to anybody like professional, uh, like psychiatrists did those, I never had the opportunity, but uh, I can imagine only because I read some of those descriptions, they have nightmares, they are afraid to, to, to go to the places like that they committed crime, even though sometimes they go back, and they have to deal with it with long, long life, long time. I don't have to. I integrate in mine, I'm fine. I accepted that. And they cannot. There is no closure for them. In, in, in life, you know that you have to close the case somehow. I, I made my closure, but they cannot. 
So for them is ongoing, ongoing guilt. You know, the feeling of the guilt is probably one of the most unpleasant feelings. And they have to deal with guilt. So I cannot maybe fully answer the question because I don't have as a professional, but I have opinion and I read some of those. They have difficult life to deal with, and I told them that. You know, have, have you ever as a doctor uh, tried to help any of these evil doing people? No, I would refuse. Because doc, patient has right to choose patient. Uh, a patient has right to choose doctor in the United States. Doctor has chosen right to, uh, and I did refuse some uh, patient. They offered me, I refused. I said, I can't help them. I'm sorry. There are so many psychiatrists in the US. Find somebody else. I was offered to treat some of those. I refused. And because that time I was ready, I'm not saying I'm going to refuse next time. Maybe I'm ready now, but I feel I'm ready. But I simply feel as a right is given to me by my profession. I'm not going to help you. <laughs> I just have a uh, question, like, uh, in the case of Viktor Frankl, like, uh, can you tell us, I'm not going to ask you about your, like, memories, so bad memories from that, but can you tell us, uh, like, the same case, like a Viktor Frankl case, like, some positive memories from that, and how did people really cope with that experience, you know, like, or was there any hope at all? Yeah, so, with Viktor Frankl introduced something called logotherapy, he was saying, you know, trauma happened, let's move on, There's make a meaning in life and make something of your life and you're going to be better. That's a good concept. But we, I want to tell you how we dealt with that. And uh, there's some story in, in, the, in, the, in the book that uh, there was a, one concentration camp was called Silas and it, I was underground somewhere deep, deep and it was very cold and the summer should be outside like 100 degree and that was like minus, you know, it was very cold and there was no light, there was no food. Uh, fortunately, it was just like a month there, I think. I was there twice, actually. But it was each time, like 30 days or something. There was no outside uh, connection to outside life at all. They didn't open the door. They, there was a wall that was like um, seven, eight feet, and they threw some food on us, like uh, uh, canned food that was hit somebody's head. And we don't have open that either. So we somehow were able to open those. And we didn't leave the place at all for any reason. It was a room much, much smaller than this. Like, it was a room of, like, regular room. Where it was 50 of us there. In that room, I can tell you how we help each other. And that was very important that after trauma, immediately or during the trauma, if you have community to help you, you can heal better. So we had poetry night. So just reciting poetry, because many of us knew some poetry. It was like, mostly, like, I can tell you, it's some like Alex Ashant, which if you know, some, some like nice poetry of Omer Khayyam, or something nice about love and, and life. And we decide poetry. So we pretended, if we live in like a normal situation, so it's a concept of normalizing abnormal situation to help your psychological uh, uh, emotions, psychological feeling. So we did that, or we, we tried to sing Sevda. Sevda is a song, a Bastan song, like uh, folk songs that talk about love, fine and women and men, and pretty much about love. Lost love, lost love, I would say, right? It's the songs that we grew up with, it's really nice. So in the time of sh that chapter when Patrick read a shooting, one night, it was 700 of us, and, and somebody started singing Sevda. And the first reaction of some prisoner was, sh shut, shut up, you know, don't, and they're going to shoot us again. And please don't sing again. It was in Britain. And then somebody else starts singing, and somebody else, and then 700 people are singing. It was so loud. And just like two hours earlier, they shoot at us, and they didn't. So it's, I don't have full explanation, but they either we surprised them or they are scared of us or inside or they didn't know what to do with us, whether they should, they have to kill all of us. But we felt good. We felt that they cannot take away everything uh, from us and we felt good we are able to sing. So soon, like for one hour, we've been singing those songs and nobody was shooting. So, I realized something about Sevda. Sevda has a more power than we believe. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. So thank you very much for presenting and sharing your experience, and thank you so much for writing the book. Uh, I would like you to elaborate, if you don't mind, on uh, forgive, forgiveness, forgive but not forget. If that's our motto, right? Talk about and it how to forgive yeah. without. How not to forget with forgiving? Um, talk, I talked about it yesterday, so I can tell you again. It's a, a forgiveness is a religious concept, and uh, forgetting is no way that you know, we have a memory. You know, there is a several center in the brain for memory, and there is a, a, emotional center. There is declarative memory. You learn that uh, I don't know that. Uh, Things in Spain happened in 1492, uh, the same year when Columbus came here or something. You remember that the declarative memory center. There is a center for the brain in the brain. But there is a center for emotional memory. And there are much longer lasting center for emotion. You, you forget when was Napoleon born or something, but you don't forget what happened to you if you are in concentration camp. So uh, there is no way of forgetting, and we should never forget. That's why we are talking about it. That's why the project about remembrance and memory, and that's why we have a museum of Holocaust. It's important to, to, to remember. About forgetting, it's a, forgiving is a religious concept, and I usually say that it's, uh, it's, it's a uh, concept that you can look from different sides. I can tell you my personal uh, uh, side. When nobody is asked me to forgive, I don't forgive. I don't offer my forgiveness. Here is my forgiveness. Like I, read, I, read, I don't know who said it. If, if you throw a plate, and plate is broken, and you say, "I'm very sorry," you know, plate doesn't come together. So back together, like it's still broken. So if you don't ask me to forgive, if you, and then not only asking, asking me nicely. <laughs> you have to be nice, and then you have to prove with your behavior. I, I, I believe in behavior. Yeah, I don't. Uh, theory is good, and you tell me about how you are good. Now, I don't know, like good Jewish guy, and but show me that you are a good Jewish guy, or Muslim, or Catholic, doesn't matter. Yeah, show I'm good student, but your grades are not good. You need to show me your behavior. But you are, they are, they are talking about forgiveness without asking for forgiveness, and without showing behavior, they are ready to forgive us. So I usually said that, you know, when in our culture, you know, when we cannot bury a person in our culture without our imam or religious leader. He, before they put him in the, you know, in the place, um, the, in the ground, imam asked three times, are we going to forgive this man? If somebody said no, there is a problem. You know, there is a problem. We have to, we all standing behind our imam and during the, the prayer, Imam Asri, are we going to forgive this person if he didn't give back some money or if he did something bad to you? Imam asked three times, and we all say, yes, we will. We have word for that, we say, halal also. And then, then that man can go in the ground. And why is Imam asking? I usually ask people, because the guy cannot talk. He's dead. So if guy is dead, somebody has to ask for that. So somebody has to ask for forgiveness. If, some, if nobody is asking, I'm not offering that. Personally, you ask me, I don't forgive. I'm not going to offer my forgiveness to anybody. They have to deal with that, but I don't hate. That's, that's different. I'm not angry at them. I process it. I'm not uh, going to do anything, and I offer this frequently. And when I do publicly, I learn from this that I offer my personal opinion that I will never torture anybody else under no circumstances. There is no circumstances in my life that I will torture another person. No. I will die, I'm ready uh, to die before I put, put my hand on somebody else for any, any reason. Unless it's self-defense that my life is dangerous, but I'm not going to. That's what I learned. So, but for Junus, no. For now. But our religion tells us to forgive. They can tell you. They can say that. And that. Our religious leader, I have I criticize them publicly every time. I disagree with them. Because they are asking, they are offering some explanation for mother who lost a child. They are offering an explanation that I disagree. I did hear 
uh, you believe or not, from some other religious leaders saying like almost like, oh, that's good, you know, they, they died fighting a shahid, you know, God will tell. No, don't, please, you know, it is not a good time to offer that explanation. Uh, they, again, their uh, organized religion is, I'm against completely, 100% in my, in, in my mind, I'm against any organized religion, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm believing God. And I don't need imam or, or, or pope or priest to tell me about that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm old enough, I passed me 50, 40 years ago, and I think I'm old enough to say, you know what, let me know, I think I know God, and I know God likes me, but I don't need a religious leader to tell me what to do, how to behave, and how to forgive or not to forgive anybody. I don't need that. I think that it would be fair to, to, for me to speak in Bosnian, if you don't mind. And thank you very much for you, all of you to ask me a good question and to, to listen. That's not the most pleasant story, but this is what this I'm here. You cannot ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> and people like me, there are many thousands of us like me. But um, thank you very much for coming in. Hvala recimo iz Srebrenica ili iz Predora ili iz bilo kojeg iz više grada, zbornika, iz Bihađa. Šta reći tim ljudima da ih ne povrijediš? To su osjetljiva pitanja. Šta reći tim ljudima koji su izgubili nekog? Ja sam tad, došlo mi je nešto da kažem, u mene je samota pričat pred našim ljudima koji su izgubili ženama koji su obrali svoje sinove i djecu ili nekog bliskog. Mada je imao u pameli da se ljudi objeno, mene ne mogu svoju traumu da stavljam ispred. I rekao sam tada nešto u vama hoćete kaži. Neobično je važno, neobično je važno da ne uspoređivamo traumu. Da ne uspoređivamo što naši ljudi hoće. Jer naši se ljudi vole dijeli, to nije normalno. Znači što je onak Vesnic Pajaš na moj YouTube snimku rekao što je zajednica manja, više se dijele. Ima jedno selo kod nas, u Poštelsko selo, Valedare tu žive, da ima neko sa mnom neko pugnuo. Znači, od Valedara, jedan od njih kaže, pa kod nas Valedara ima deset familija i na nes u rani struja. Jer tu je nevjerovatno koliko mi hoćemo da se dijelimo. Mi se hoćemo da dijelimo po tome ko je koliko više traumatizirano. Malte ne da se brojimo, ja sam izgubio pet članova familije, ti si sedam, no što ti tebi je gore, ili ja sam više, ja sam bio 20 dana više u logoru nego ti i sad, eto ja sam malo drugčiji. Hajde da probamo ovako da pričamo ko ljudi, da ne smijemo da se dijelimo na toj osnovi koji je ko više traumatiziran, koji ne smijemo, svi smo prošli, mada nisi bio ovdje, ja sam pričao sa Sašom više puta, Hemonom. On nije bio u ratu, on nije istorio traumatizirano, bila mu je tamo familija, pa kakve veze ima, jesi li bio tamo? I mi se dijelamo, ja ti ja sam bio, volim da nisam. Neka volim što sam, neka volio, bio sam na frontu, skoro u godini pol dana, borio sam, nisam nija šta, znao, nisam znao kako se borite, ali pomagao sam ljudima koji su ranjeni, morao sam, onda me uvap se ovi, ustaša i tamo u godinu dana, bez nikakve potrebe. I sad bi ja trebao da računam, Eto, ti si bio samo četiri mjeseca na manjači, eto, sad i meni je gore. Hajde da prvo vam da to ne radimo, jedne sa druge. Znači, svi smo prošli koji gdje si bio u ratu, nisi bio u ratu, svi smo afektirani na neki način. I to hoću da vam kažem. I ovo što sam ja razgovarao, što me repli pripao na engleskom, jako važan koncept. Kakav viktiv i onaj, kako se kaže viktiv? Kakva šrtva? Ima ona žena iz Srebrenica, jedna upoznala sam i sad u Sarajevo na konferenciji, ona je ona kada joj rekne žrtva, ona je ti oči iskopala. Kada mi se zadaži, bila neka konferencija, mene pozvala da bude 
kao da malo budem sam da ja nešto rekao, ne bih velika konferencija međunarodna, bilo iz Vanja Luke, bilo iz Srba, bilo je bilo iz Zagreba, bilo iz Rijeke, bilo od svakne iz Srbije, iz Beograda bilo. I sad on neko njoj reče to žrt, a ona još ovdje kako se izbada ruka i još gora ova, ovo će oče da vadi, ti sam ja žrta. Ja sam preživio to, preživio li. I znači, telo je da ne merimo traumu, da se ne dijelimo na tome i da ne govorimo da smo žrta, nego smo preživili to i idemo, idemo dalje. Šta je da radimo sad sa ovim što smo preživili? Tijek onda ja govorim, ja sam bio šef ovoga, bio sam godinu dana, ali neću da mjerim to sa nekim drugim koji je bio manje od mene. Da vam kažem, meni je bilo gore. E tu hoću da vam kažem. Hoću da vam kažem da za opraštanje. Kako opraštanje? Ono meni kaže jedna na konferenciji u Tucson. Ja znam, mi kažemo, ja sam islam sirtujem. Da vam kažem, ja to ne kažem, ja znam islam u silu toga. Ja mi to kažemo, ja mu htio halal, na ovom svijetu, hak ti je na ovom svijetu, znači hak je jedno, halal je drugo. Tko ne zna da objasnim, halal, ja tako kažem, ok, ja prema problema, ja ću ti uprostiti o halalu, ću ti, ja to moraš ti slobodno umret, nema nikakvih problema, ja ću ti umret, ja sam ti halal, ja te gore čekaj hak. Odgovor za mnoj što se radi. To je taj koncept koji ja prihvatam. Ja, što je rekao Dino Merlin kad je bio u Beogradu na intervju, kad je imao koncert i ovaj ga doveo onaj poznat jedan kao što ima onaj show, jel' Ivano mi se zove? Ivano Ivano. Ja, kako zove? Ivano Ivano. Ja, on ga doveo i ono ga malo interesantan je tip. I on pita Dino Melina kao, hajti da ja i ti Dino odmah raštimo što si ti nas u sebe mrziš, jer si to rekao više puta. I kao Dino Melina polavno, gleda i kaže, kako kaže. Svi putevi vode odne klete. Svaki put vodi odne klete. Moj put vodi i Sarajevo. Mora biti da sam u neka dola, kad sam išao po hljeb, kad su oko mene padale granate i ubijale moje komšije, da sam nešto vama ružba rekao. Mora biti ti nešto. A ne mrzim. E to je taj koncept, ono je to lijepo gajstvo. Znači, mora biti u tom trenu. Kad ti ubije komšiju, kad ti ubije prvo rođaka, jel' djetu, moja roca je izgubila djetu, sada je prva roca, osam godina, od mojih prijatelja, isto tako, amen, od vas sviju. I sada mi treba da govorimo, eto, kao mi ćemo vama to halalit, a oni ništa, oni isto odalje rade. Noć, žica, srbenica, transparenti u Beogradu, i sad ćemo mi njima halalit malo sutra. I treba im to reći ovako, ja to svugdje govorim, ja. Malo sutra ću te halal. Ne možem. I ovaj, i tako i to sam pisao u knjige. Onda je taj drugi dio knjige, taj prvi dio knjige govori o tim logorima, o svakom koji sam bio, to sam provo da opišem. A drugi dio govori o tim šta radi sa tom traumom. I na kraju jedno veliko pogleda, kad sam bio u Hagu, kao moram ispričati, gledala sam u suđenja Karoviča, to je jedan od najinteresantnijih došlja, ja za mene bio. Stvarno nisam htio da idem, a Julian Ravala na me, hajde u Hagu, hajde, moramo pisati chapter of justice, da to opravdi, moramo pisati opravdi. Ako nešto idemo, moraš se čak gledati, karoš, kao ono epizetar, kakve veze imaš da je epizetar čovjek? Kao je to, nikakve veze nema što je karoš epizetar. Oni hoće nešto da kažu da je to važno u njegovom konstruktu. Ja lično ne mislim da je važno. Onda je doktor nikad da ne bi radio što je radio. I hajde da budem ja u taj Hagu. Suđer i svjedok je bio doktor jedan koji je direktor bio vojne bolnice, Mladenović, moj ime, tako nešto je Milanović, direktor, doktor. I on je svjedok i sada ulazim ja, često pričam, ulazim ja i ovaj staklo je, staklo je između nas i njega, on sjedi i kara čisti, ono malo smršao, kosao nam isto, bez veze. I jedno kaže, i kako sam ja ušao, stvarno, moram je spričati, on je pogledao prema nama. Još je Ajša žena me i Džulija je pogledao prema nama. Zato što nije bilo puno raje u publici, pa je nešto me nabišao, ja kažu meni, ona je gledao mene zato što imam brad, mislim da sam neki srbeni, ja kažu gledao Ajšu jer vada. I gledam i to osuđenje, gledam i on priča, ovo me direktor bolnice svjedoči kako su bolnice gledane, kako su pacijenti ubijane. 
I on kaže sad ovako. Kaže koji je god bio u Sarajevu dobro zna poziciju jevrojskog groblja, da se sa jevrojskog groblja vojna bolnica ne vidi. I sad vojno govori, pa, radovane, mi smo koji se odrasli, živjeli radu u Sarajevu, znaš da se ovako se vidi vojna bolnica, najviše zgleda u Sarajevu u tom dijelu. Mislim, sve druge zgrade, ja to znam kroz svoju čakitu, taj kraj, to sve druge zgrade na dva splata male koji će se i onda vojna bolnica od 25 splata, tako nešto, sva je ona izbušena. Kaže, ne vidi se, krži. I kad sam pričao to o Devidu i Mjerevišću Kraga, on, pošto je David, znači još židov, odveo ga na jebrijsku Evropu, ja vam pričao to pričao. Kaže, David, pa gdje je ta vojna bolnica? Rekao, aj ti pogledaj tamo, koju izgled vidiš? Kaže, ono, aj to je tako. E ovako se vidi. I sad vam svjedoči u Hagu, da se ta bolnica ne vidi sa jevrijskog groblja odakle su Srbi imali svoje pošaje. I kad je on to rekao, pošto ja znam Srbi, ja su s tome pošao na mene, kaže, ađu, ja nemam moj tič na moj, ostani, moram ću što kaže, kad da postoje, aj ti to razglabav, razglabaj ti koliko hoćeš, odo ja na kafu u Hagu. Hag je prelijep jedan grad, inače je vrlo lijep, ako iko bio zna, vrlo fin grad, imaju dobru kafu, kapučinu, dobre pice, dobru hranu, Odo ja i tad sam stvarno, nisam možda razmišljao kako će veliku caj na mene taj događaj ostaviti. Osjetio sam se kao, tad sam se osjetio kao pravi pobjednik. Kad sam skontao, odo ja kad ja hoću, a on ostao u Čeliji. On je u Čeliji već, ko zna, četve godine, ako ne se sjeća tačan datum kad je uopšen, i ko zna koliko će još biti. A ja odo, slobodan čovjek. E to je taj moment koji je meni dosta pomogao. Iako sam odbio da ga vidim. Jesi li sad uopšte pratio i da li te interesuje i šta misliš o ovoj presnici, šta je što će biti izrečena za Esek Bosnu Prlić i ostalo? Jesam, jesam, ja dobio sam, ja sam ova žena jedna naša iz Višeg rada, ona je pod parom za štampu cijelog suda Haga već u 67 godina i kad smo mi bili, ona je nas pričekala i ona mi je dala te dostupne informacije, onda što je dostupno preko interneta ili preko prijatelja u Sarajevo dobiva. Ja se dobit ću ono neku presudu i treba jedno dobiti presudu, jer vrlo je jasno, znaš, ljudi neki ne znaju. Hrvatska je napravila agresiju na Bosnu i Hercegovinu 1993. godine. Ja kad sam sad pripremao ovaj prezentaciju, Felix su dvali po prezentaciju sa židovima o holokaustu, ja sam govorio o genocidu, većinom sam govorio o Srebrenici i Prijedru, i o Hercegovine, dosta sam naučio i našao sam dokument, i objavljen je dokument kako se tuđman i naložaju sastajali. I ovaj jedan zadnji se usred, kad su oni imali ovu mapu, oni su se dogovorili sve, se dogovorili osim stovoca i mostara. Tuđman je tražio stolac i mostar, samo da vam kažem, ko ne zna dobro poziciju, ima Nerenta rijeka, i tamo na zapadnu stranu je zapadna Hercegovina etnički 100% očišćena. Tamo nijedan osoban ne živi u Srbiji, 100%. A od Nerete vamo je počitelj i stolac i mostar, dio mostara, i ovaj Dubrave, taj lijepi dio koji je pod privredni kraj, i tu je tražio tuđman. Zbog čega? Jer su to bile granice panove, ne NDH. I Milošević nije dao. I tu se posuđali, zato smo mi morali vratiti sa Hrvatima, oni su nas napali da nam to uzmu. E to je razlog za rat. Ja to nisam znao do nazad mjesec dana, jer sam dobio materijala, hiljade ustanica sam prošao da pripremim dobru prezentaciju, tu koja je bila utorak sada. Znači oni se dogovaraju, 17 puta se sastali i nisu dogovorili oko ta dva grada, zato smo imali i onda su Hrvati nas napali, mi smo se dobro pravili, stavili četiri brigade, mi sve znamo, znamo te ljude, znamo i njihove komandante, Četvrta Splitska brigada, prva Zagrebaška, treća Osječka i jedna Vinkovačka. Ja znam te ljudi koji su odrli, znam ih jednostavno. Mislim, viđao sam ih. I oni su napravili agresiju na nas, Hrvatske. I ljudi koji su gore bili u zapu, istočno je posjetni ili gore više, oni to ne znaju, ali sad znate, oni su nam... Mi smo se mogli odbraniti, ali oni su dobili pomoć iz Hrvatske. Stavili su nas u logore, 20.000 hiljada, 
ako ovce su nastavno odvojili, to, to je tako. Psijološki Mark Vizdar je napisao pjesmu koja se zove Jedan vode i četvoricu, četvorica se jedno boji. To je tako u toj. Imali su oružje, mi nismo. I imali su potporu države i stavili su nas u ovu rete. I to sam pričao kako Mostarc, pogotovo Most, mislim, Mostavi, ono, oni su napravili grad koji je bio ponosan na te um, sve što nije kao ono klasično državno, jednostavno Mostar, oni su imali u vojsku moji prijatelji dobri. Ja sam im govorio da, da pravim armiju u Bosnijaci, oni su pravili teritorijom, oni su pravili i svoje obrana Mostara, naša raja, ono Bosnijaci. I ovaj, u Mostaru oni nisu se nadali što će im komšije vratiti, ono samo se nisu nadali. Istini taj priča, on, ovaj, da je komšija Hrvatica puškao mi da je ušao u stan, čovjek sa ženom pije kapu. A taj dan su uhapsili preko 27 Mostaraca. Ja sam bio već zarobljen već 3 mjeseca, jer smo su ranije... Ja sam zatvoren, uh, juče, uh, sad sam to prošle sence kad sam ovo pripremao, ja sam zatvoren 20. aprila na Hitleru rođetan. <laughs> Tako da čupam i Hitleru rođetan dok sam živ. 20. aprila sam uopšen, eto sad mi je godišnjica. I, ovaj, i, i, i moj, moj organizam to pan, je slabije spavam taj mjesec. I ovaj mostarac u glavnom sjedi, on ne znam, 20.000 ljudi se hapsi taj dan i kaže ovaj dolazi ovaj, susjed s puškom i kaže vajmo. Kaže ovaj dječemo, kaže vajmo, vidimo, kaže na stadiju. Kaže s kim beleš igra danas. On pita ko, sa kim beleš igra, on misli da igra beleš, a on je na 20 dana na stadion, već zarobljeno. I ovaj pita sa kim beleš igra, u srednu stara, znaš, tako da nismo bili spremni, nažalost. Sve, tako. Sad bi volio da, 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 da čujem ako ima neko od vas na našem jeziku, ako ima još neko pitanje, ako nema, da da završimo. Ja, ova knjiga će biti prevedena kao voda na, na, na bosanski. Dobio sam e-mail jučer da, su, da je ova kompan, ova, pabrična kompanija Vanderbilt University Press odobrila jednoj našoj kompaniji da se se knjiga štampa na bosanskoj mjestu. Kako voda? Dobra knjiga. Ja, kontaktirao me direktor na knjiga našao me na internetu, kontaktirao me. Ja mu rekao pošao pismo Vanderbilt, ne znam, imam ja sam imao ugovor za ovdje. Onda je on rekao, ako je zabasno, nije to neki velik tiraž, dao mi im jedno čepanje za pravo. A ko, znaš ko će prevoditi? Uh, oni su rekli da će, da će ovaj, naći, imam ja, imam ja, ako imaš i ti nekoga. Onda sam mislio da on zna sa Sendersom Karićem, on je neobično dobar pisac, mogu pitao da pomogu, ne malo i tako. Možemo pričati. Volio da ako imate pitanje, ali ne mora biti pitanje, uopšte nekako vaš komentar, neki, ovaj, jer je bilo nezgodno, bilo dugo je bilo da na engleskom, pa sam na bosanskom malo sam vam dojadio, jer je ovaj tako. Ma nije malo. Pa ne znam šta je, ko? Znaš kako kaže, zabraje do kuše, da znaš, kaže u ovaj pjesmi. Ko će slušati tuđe moku? Ja, brat. Ja, ali znaš šta je, važne su ove knjige i zato ja kažem vama, važne su ove knjige. Pišite svoje događaje, da mora biti u knjigi. Ima ovaj institut ovdje na univerzitetu sa, uh, sa pačkom i venom da, da se bilježite šta vam se dogodilo. Imate šansu u neko vam je dao da to uradite. Za bilježite, jako je važno. Ja, ja često kažem, ovaj Mula Mustafa Bašeski, ja, i ona žive tamo nekde u 19. vijek, kraj je jedna mora u početku drugog. I uh, on je bilješ 1907. Kasnije uče. 906. Sada ćete reći kada je umro, evo i sljedeća. Ne zna se, možete misliti, ne zna se tačno kada je umro u početku. Zna se, ja sam unašla nezadnjeno da je tako. Koji je ugodno umro? Pokaži ti nezadnjeno. Reci mi koji je ugodno umro. Reci sada. Ima meza, dugo su, možete misliti, on je bio jedini postupi, jedini letopisac, on je pisao događaje šta se dešavalo u vrijeme, u njegovo vrijeme u Sarajevo i oko Sarajeva. I ovo, nije živio cijelo vrijeme u Sarajevo, živio on i drugim mjestima i tako. I puno se vratio u Sarajevo da je počeo pisati o tim događajima. I on je rekao tu poznatu rečenicu koju ja koristim u svaki put. Kaže, ono što nije zapisano, nije se dogodilo. Čak i kad je sad zapisano, ovo, i on hoće da kažu da se nije dogodilo. 
Čak je pričao sam i prvi dan kad se u te zluge i 70 djece to ti kaže. Nisu ljubili, nismo im ni ljubili kao oni su donijeli tijela na taj drugo i stavili i tamo da kažu da smo mi zločinci. I ti roditelji su ga tužili. Ovo je naprijed su vrlo finu tušku za to. Jer su ta djeca od 15-16 godina na prosjeku ubijena. Begajer i Hak nije ni rad bio, ni ništa sjedili su kafići. Oni, oni su zato što su i NATO bombardovao. Popisana primjer. Popisana primjer je bila i sad. I on, sad, on je taj čovjek na vlasti, on kaže nisu, to su donijeli tijela na taj drugo. To je on rekao javno. Zato su, a to je bilo 95. Dvadeset i pet maja, dana mladost bio i on ide na kapiju, da se da... Jes, dvadeset i pet maja, to se zaboravio. I tako da je jako važno, ali često kažem i ovaj dio priče, kad je umro Bašeski, ja, te godine... Poznat, profesor. Kad je umro Bašeski, ja, onda on je pisao svaki dan šta je bilo u Sarajevo. Te socijalne događaje, onda je... Rektorali su novo, pa što ste znate, ona već kaže, umro, umro, ona, Ivo Adam Andrić, ko će sad biti pisac? I to je, kaže, umro, pa što ste, nema niko da piše toga, šta je, onda sam, tražno ljude ima liko da nastavi, da piše, pa je da to pisa, pa što ste, nije se niko javio, onda sam našao njegovog sina. I rekla, moj ti vole piši, ona je, pa ovo ti je pisao, eto, znaš ga, vatim ti piši to, šta se je dešavalo, ma neću, ne znam ja ta priča, kažem, haj vole, pa, Kažem, dobro, i sad on počne pisat. I njegov prvi član je bio, kaže, danas je u MHG na Kovačima otelila kraj. Onda su mu rekli, nemoj ti pisat. Rek su mu nemoj ti pisat, kaj bi je to to. Jer je Bašeski pitao o socijalnim i istorijskim događajima. Kako je Bašeski i kako je MHG uvrlo? Ali bilo su, jako je važna ta njegova rečenica, ono što nije zapisano, nije se ne dogodilo. Tako da ja hoću da vama kažem svim, čak i recimo i tebi koji nema što, bilo bi jako interesantno, ne sad sam se sjetio, sad ću vam nešto reći, završili smo, bilo bi jako interesantno da ti napišeš priču, o iskustvu tvojih roditelja. Tva oba roditelja su ljekari bili i ti znaš njive priče i da napišeš priču o tvojom iskustvu, a da je njih uključiš. Izaće knjiga, vrlo brzo, kao Bog da je. Ja sam je pročitao. Napravio je Susan Shapiro, writer, pisac from New York, iz New Yorka, je napisala knjigu sa Kenanom Trbinčevićem. Kenan Trbinčević, on je iz Bečkog. Iz Bečkog. Vrlo važno, ja sam ti rekao juče, kako je dobra knjiga, ja bolje ništa prošlo nisam. Njemu je deset godina u ratu, u Brčkom, i on opisuje iz svoje perspektive, od djeteta od deset godina do dana kad je on prvi put otišao u Bosnu prije jedno od tri, četiri godine. Njegova priča i želja za ovom svetom i ta njegova borba, kako to da njegov... To je odmah na početku, njegov trener karatea kluba, isto u Peru, tako ima ima, ga uči, diže ga na ruke, ga ono čestitan kad položi neki crni pojaz i prvi dan rata majka ga pošle da kupe i ljep, jer se boje rote ljubiće i neka na ulici, kao neće dijete, ali smije što kaže, on smije. I on vidi Peru, svog učitelja karatea koji ga je trenirao, da je 5-6 godina najmanje. I drago mu što ga vidi, osjeća se siguran, a ovaj Pjeru pušku i hoće da ga ubije. I ne da mu da kupi i ljepi vrati ga. Iz njegove te perspektive, knjiga se zove The Bosnian List. To je Patrick New Book to look for. It's an amazing book, it's going to be published soon. By Susan Shapiro and Ken Anthony Bershko. Ten year old, his perspective. So I'm encouraging people here in St. Louis to write a story about personal experience and parents. It doesn't have to be a book, write a story, put it to somebody, give it to somebody. Give it to me, I'll publish it. I have a project. I'm gathering story from other people. I have a project to, to, to write a book, okay? And follow up, you know. Oh, I, 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 I,